Hello VC, it's Jim. Today I thought I'd talk about Von Oliver. Um, it's been a little bit since I've contributed a video to the community. I've been uh, moving into our house. It's taken a few months for us to kind of get things squared away and taken all, all of our time and attention and haven't been able to do much else. Um, but things have quieted down a bit, so I'm uh, trying to start this up again. Vaughn Oliver was the in-house designer for 480 Records. He um, was a big influence on me as an artist and as a designer. So I wanted to uh, kind of do a little bit of a, a thank you to Vaughn. Um, he passed away a couple months ago in December. And uh, here we go. So first is Modern English, Mesh and Lace um, from 1981. This is the first record that um, comes under the 23 Envelope moniker. Uh, 23 Envelope was a name that Von Oliver used to essentially make it seem like they were a bigger design firm. It was really just Von Oliver. Um, and he worked with uh, Nigel Grierson quite a bit for really most of the 80s. But Grierson was a freelance photographer, but he was never employed by 480. So really it was just one guy. This is Nature Mort, Still Lives which is a um, collection of 4AD artists from 1981. And um, this is on a Japanese label. It was their Japanese distributor. It's kind of the early phase of um, 4AD before they kind of really figured out who they were. Um, there's some great stuff on here and some you know, weird stuff as well. Uh, but it's really kind of the beginning of the, the kind of graphic identity that um, Von Oliver was kind of building. This is Yaz, or Yazoo, You and Me Both. This is an existing photo that Nigel Grierson had that he um, brought to the project. Um, this is actually for Mute Records, it's not for 4AD. They did some work outside of 4AD, not a lot. This Mortal Coil, the first EP. Um, this is an existing photo that Vaughn Oliver took on a cross-country trip of America. Um, I always thought that this was a very much a uh, David Lynch-inspired photograph. What I'm showing here is uh, the recent, I think, 2019 uh, re-releases of This Mortal Coils, Italand in Tears, Filigree in Shadow, and Blood. The Photos are of a model named Pallas Citrone, uh, who were taken, and these were all taken by uh, Nigel Grierson. The uh, first photos were um, offered to Modern English for their Ricochet Days album, but they turned them down because they thought their girlfriends might object. So uh, Ivo instead um, used them for this mortal coil. Pallas Citrone ended up being the model on all three records. But on the second record, uh, before it was decided that she would be the model, um, Ivo tried to get uh, Maria Schneider, um, the actress from Last Tango in Paris, to be the model, uh, but she um, kind of unceremoniously turned him down. Uh, so they ended up using Pallas on all three, um, and I think it's just perfect. This is Filigree and Shadow. So the three This Mortal Coil records span the time between 1983 and 1991. This is the 10-inch um, for drugs. Um, the inset photo is by the Lumiere brothers. These are all um, gatefold editions. The original um, releases, the first record was just a single record, so it wasn't a gatefold. The second, I, I seem to remember my copy not being a gatefold, just two records in a set, in a single sleeve. Um, and I didn't have the vinyl version of Blood, I just had it on CD, so I'm not sure what that was originally released as. 
um, but these, uh, these new additions are just beautiful, just absolutely beautiful. This is Garland's from Cocteau Twins. We jump back to 1982. This image was actually a uh, photograph that Nigel took in college as a uh, alternative image for Susie and the Banshee's album, Scream. It's a good thing he didn't tell Robin about because uh, apparently he was really sick of the Susie and the Banshee's comparisons at the time. So the Lullabies EP, uh, the photos here are actually um, a juxtaposition that was made in a publication in 1937 called Our Lily, Aram Lily. Next is Head Over Heels and Sunburst and Snowblind from 1983. These two sleeves were from the same photo shoot. They represent, I think, a pretty big step for um, Vaughn Oliver and Nigel Grierson, uh, both in design and photography. Oliver said the inspiration had to be music or the work is worthless. And in terms of reflecting music, you can see music as textures, colors, ideas, or the words that pop out at you. Um, I think this is the first time that they really were able to pull that off. Pearly Dew Drops Drops from 1984. Um, this is kind of going back to the approach that they had on lullabies, which is um, using kind of an old photograph set into a textured background, uh, though I think that with Pearly Dew Drops Drops, uh, they did a much better job of that. Tiny Dynamine and Echoes in a Shallow Bay. These records were meant as a set and the design for these were essentially conceived as a set as well. These were Robin Guthrie's favorite sleeves and his favorite recordings from the Cocteau Twins as well. Victoria Land. Uh, this is not much as far as design goes, but the photograph is beautiful. It was actually from the same session as the um, Echoes in a Shallow Bay and Tiny Dynamine. Um, simple and beautiful. Love's Easy Tears from 1986. Uh, this is another paint on water photograph, I believe. Uh, the, um, the printing technique though for this cover is really beautiful. It's a kind of a metallic sheen to the cover um, and it really makes the uh, photograph kind of um, a little bit more special. Uh, covers always reminded me of um, Bob Dowling's photo on metal uh, from Pink Floyd. Uh, you can see the comparison here. Here's uh, The Moon and the Melodies, which was um, really Cocteau Twins with uh, Harold Budd. So it's my understanding that this is um, not actually Vaughn Oliver uh, and this is just Nigel Grierson because um, Robin Guthrie had refused to work with uh, Vaughn Oliver anymore. Um, and it's, it's a fine cover but it's just, um, there's not much to it. So Color Box from 1985. This is a, an image that was actually found on the floor of a printing studio um, in the early 60s by one of Oliver's teachers uh, that he had given him. So pretty much the cover was just used exactly as is um, with the addition of the name. Baby I Love You So, uh, Color Box, uh, 1986, I believe. This is really using the same technique as the previous cover, um, but just creating it again because um, the other one was essentially a found object. Diffuse, 1985, Extractions. Clan of Zymox from 1986. Um, this is kind of taking that layered technique that he started using with um, Colorbox and really kind of taking it to an extreme. The photograph of the dolls in this uh, was actually from um, Oliver's uh, college professor, Terry Dowling. Uh, there's a lot of Brothers Quay influence in this, um, in the image itself. It's, I think it's just a beautiful image. Uh, this is now, I believe, in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. Uh, these are the Mystery of the Bulgarian Voice, Volumes 1 and 2, from 1986 and 1988. Um, 
I always thought the design was better on volume two, but the um, photograph was beautiful on volume one. Uh, and on volume two, uh, the photograph was by um, Simon Larbelestier, but you really can't see it very well, so I'm, I'm not sure it worked very well. Lonely as an Eyesore from 1987. Uh, this was the last project as 23 Envelope. Oliver continued working with 4AD under the name V23, but um, he kind of uh, ended his relationship with Nigel Grierson at this point. I think they kind of came up together, and I'm not sure that Oliver felt comfortable really directing Nigel Grierson. So um, at a point, and you could see it back on some of the Cocteau Twins records from around this time, um, uh, he considered Grierson's photographs to kind of be um, complete works in and of themselves. And so there wasn't really much you could do design-wise that kind of played off of that or worked with it. And, uh, and so their relationship kind of dissolved um, by this point. Uh, they kind of went out with a bang because um, they made a, a really amazing box set that contains the album, the CD, and a, um, a video that was uh, produced by Nigel. Um, really amazing. It was like limited to 100 copies, and you can get one these days for about three grand or something. Uh, so needless to say, I don't have one. Um, one's in the v &A Museum, though. The Wolfgang Press, Standing Up Straight from 1986. The cover was really concepted by the band, uh, and that's why there's a band photo on the back cover, which is something that you almost never see from 23 Envelope. Uh, and I think this cover is really pretty weak. Um, the insert, though, is beautiful. All the typography was done by Chris Big, who would become um, kind of Von Oliver's right-hand man. We always have our own ideas. We, I think we worked in a different way with Vaughn to how other people have, in that we, we come forward with an idea and then talk with him about it, and it's, it's like a collaboration. Yeah, each band, he, each band works different with them. Like, they do it like that, and when we, just, um, we just let him do whatever he wants to do, and then we see the finished product, and it's like, it's always good. Pixies. Uh, this is um, the 20... Uh, 19 edition of Come On Pilgrim and Surfer Rosa, where they collected the uh, initial EP and first LP together. The photographs are taken by uh, Simon Larbelestier. The direction that Frank Black gave to um, Vaughn Oliver for, for the first record was, um, what did he say? He said, I like nudes, I like figurative work, I like darkness. And, uh, and so um, Von Oliver actually came across the photo of the, the guy with the hairy back uh, at a, an exhibit um, for the Royal College of Art. It was a degree show, and that's actually where he came across Simon Larbelestier uh, originally. Um, and he thought that photo was perfect for it. And then, and then he um, art directed and concepted the, um, the flamenco dancer. Um, and that's probably why there's a fish hanging on the wall. So Doolittle, um, this is another project with um, Larva Lestier. I actually didn't own the uh, vinyl version originally. Um, I had the CD and I kind of liked the CD packaging a little bit better because it had a booklet inside that um, allowed you to see this whole photo shoot that they had done, concepting all the songs for uh, Doolittle. And um, there's some great photographs in there. Um, the vinyl is nice, but surprisingly, I prefer the CD on that one. Throwing Muses, House Tornado, 1987. Um, the um, watercolor and uh, collage work here is done by um, uh, an artist named Shinro Otaki. Uh, I just thought this is really just beautiful stuff. The Breeders Pod from 1989. Uh, that's actually Vaughn Oliver there with um, dead eels strapped to his underwear dancing around. 
Pale Saints, The Comforts of Madness. Um, this originally came out in 1990. Uh, this version, though, is the 30th anniversary edition that came out this year. Um, Von Oliver really didn't like this, uh, this cover, but I think it's pretty awesome. Heidi Berry, 1993. Um, again, uh, Simon Larville SDA on this um, with those Venus flytrap photos. Dead Can Dance, Spirit Chaser from 1996. Uh, they didn't work much with Dead Can Dance, uh, who preferred to make their own album covers, which is probably one reason why the Dead Can Dance album covers are not spectacular. Lush, the origami box set, um, record spanning from 1989 to 1996. Uh, this came out in 2016. I mean, there was no kind of manifesto, if you like. Um, and if there's, a, I mean, I understand there is a label identity now, but it's been a very organic development. You know, just sleeve by sleeve, it's inevitable. It's just coming from one desk most of the time. Um, and I think sometimes the label identity gets in the way. Um, it comes in, in front of the, the band's identity sometimes. I'm well, well aware of that, but certainly not the intention. You know. um, and that's something I'd like to lose at times as well, and just. Uh, you know, use your left hand instead of using your right hand and stop, stop thinking about it. <laughs> 